you meditate to put an end to the causes of suffering and stress. And as the Buddha said, there are two kinds, which means you need two kinds of meditation, or two aspects to the meditation. The first kind is the kind of suffering or stress that's, whose cause goes away all you, when all you do is just look at it with equanimity. In other words, you don't react, you're just there with it, watching it, and the cause of stress just gets embarrassed and goes away. It's there because you haven't been looking carefully, you've been ignoring it, but if you turn and look at it, you realize that this is really dumb. You're causing yourself stress and it's unnecessary. Why do it? So there is that aspect of the meditation where you just look at things. But there's another kind of cause of stress. The Buddha says it doesn't go away when you look at it. It just sort of sits there and keeps acting. That's the kind of, if you compare it to a person, it's like someone who has no sense of shame whatsoever. You can see that it's causing stress, and it says basically, so what? I like this. This is what I want. And you find that it has lots of friends in the committee of your mind that will argue for it. That kind of suffering, or that kind of cause of suffering, the Buddha said, goes away only when you do what he calls exert a fabrication. The word fabrication, sankara here, means you work with intention. You try to figure it out. You try to use various strategies to deal with it. And the strategies can be either involved with physical fabrication, which is the breath, or verbal fabrication is the way you frame the issue in your mind and talk to yourself about it. And then there's mental fabrication, which is perceptions of labels you have for things which can either be individual words or it can be little pictures. And then feelings, feelings of pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And you can work with all of these things to do with that second kind of cause. And there are times when working with pleasure is good and work, times when working with pain is good. All of these points the Buddha made in a sutta where he's talking about his conversations with the Jains. Now, the Jains believed that if you just were equanimous about everything that came up, good, bad, and different, that's all you had to do. And they particularly liked to be equanimous about pain. They felt that if you could stare the pain down and just be with it without reacting in any way whatsoever, that you'd be burning off your old karma and that would be getting rid of that particular cause of suffering. And they accused the Buddhist monks of living in pleasure and living in indulgence. And the Buddha said, well, yeah, there is a kind of pleasure that is actually good for the practice. This was one of his first realizations. He'd been undergoing all sorts of self-torture for six years. He finally reached the point where he realized that this is not working. I thought, is there another way? He had tried sensual pleasures, and that didn't work. He had tried self-torment, that didn't work. What was left? So he found he'd been thinking. and terms of black and white, all pain, all pleasure. All pleasure is bad, all pain is good. Well, neither was right. So he took a more nuanced look. Okay, what kind of pleasure is okay? And he realized the pleasure of concentration. He got the mind totally focused. You start out by just directing your thoughts, which is a fabrication, toward a single object and evaluating the object so the mind can settle down with it, like we're doing right now here with the breath. You work with the breath. If it's not comfortable, you can work with it and make it longer, shorter, faster, slower, deeper, more shallow. See what does feel comfortable right now. The breath itself is a fabrication. Your direct to thought and evaluation, that's a fabrication too. And they have, as the Buddha realized, no blame. Looking for pleasure in this way is blameless. Sometimes you hear about the dangers of concentration, but the Buddha never talked in those terms. I mean, the one danger is that you get good at it and then you don't get better. In other words, you don't move on to use the concentration for gaining insight. But there's nothing wrong with getting good at the concentration. In fact, it's absolutely necessary. He says without that you can't really see things clearly. You see some things, but not everything. There's a lot that gets hidden when the mind isn't really, really still. 
So you fabricate a calm state of mind, you fabricate comfortable breathing, that kind of pleasure is okay. That kind of fabrication is useful for seeing things you wouldn't see otherwise. Because once you get used to this level of pleasure, and you go back to your old ways, you begin to realize okay, these, not our, these ways of thinking, these ways of acting are not so attractive anymore. That's why one way of working with pleasure and using fabrication, physical, verbal, mental, to work with some of the defilements that are causing you suffering and stress. There are other times, though, when you have to work with pain. In other words, you have to take an unpleasant object or pick up an unpleasant way of thinking. Or be willing just to sit with pain. To see what is it in the mind that makes the pain even worse. Because there are some times when you are indulging in various pleasures and you find the quality of your mind is going down. So you've got to do something about that. This is where you have to deal with pain. The Buddha says that contemplation of the body is a painful topic. Or as we were saying today, sometimes you can work with a body. But that's not an all-around approach to dealing with lust, a sensual desire. Because as the Buddha said, we're actually attached not so much to the object of the lust or the object of the desire. We're attached to the process of desiring itself. It's fun to think about things that you might want and to plan about them. We're addicted to this. So you have to turn around and look at the process of desiring, lusting, craving something. From a point of view which allows you to see that this is nothing you really want to get involved with. You can start seeing this is really unattractive because it's, there's an attraction there that gives rise to the passion. And it's the passion that keeps us fabricating these things again and again and again. So you want to be able to look at it in a way that allows you to pull back and say, nope, I see the direct connection between this and uh, the suffering that it causes, and it's not worth it. So find some way of looking at how bad lust can be for you. As I was saying today, you might ask yourself if you could have a tape recording or an insight into the person you're, you're lusting for when they see you coming. It might turn you off totally. You might realize that you're a fool. That would be enough to give rise to some dispassion. In other words, you have to exercise your imagination here to look at things in a new way. Because in either case, you're, what you're trying to do is give rise to a sense of dispassion for that particular cause of suffering, because it's the passion that gets us involved with it and keeps us involved. And we're not going to stop until we can really develop a strong dispassion for these things. So you find that in some cases what I have to do is get the mind quiet and look at something and it begins to wither away, because it just doesn't compare with the, the pleasure of the concentration. There are other parts of the mind that say, okay, we'll have concentration, but we'll have this too. I'll have my times to be still, but I'll also have times to go for that particular desire, that particular defilement. Sometimes it's anger. Sometimes we like anger. This is where you have to start thinking about these things in ways that develop this passion for them. And again, use the three kinds of fabrication. When anger comes, what does it feel like? What does your breathing feel like? Many times the breathing aggravates the anger. What happens if you try to breathe in a calm way? It soothes the body down, even though the mind may be running around on fire, but at least you can breathe calmly and see that what that does. And you look at the issue. How are you looking at the issue that's giving rise to anger? Can you look at it in a different way? Or what are the underlying perception? Are you perceiving yourself as a victim? Are you really totally a victim, or are you just doing that to make yourself feel justified in lashing out? 
You've got to take these things apart. If you don't take them apart, they'll just stay there as a solid lump in the mind. And no matter how much you just look at them and treat them with equanimity and are non-reactive, they're not going to go anywhere. You have to be able to see through them, see exactly how a particular desire is related to a particular cause of suffering, and how the suffering is related to that, and ask yourself, is it worth it? So as you meditate, you can't have just one approach. You have to have many approaches, because the causes of suffering in the mind have many approaches as well, and they have their power over the mind in many different ways. So learn to develop your range as a meditator, because only then will you be able to ferret out the causes of suffering that simple non-reactivity can't touch. After all, you want to be able to ferret out, ferret out everything that's causing suffering so you can abandon your attachment to everything that causes suffering, because who wants any suffering at all? Some people will content themselves and say, well, okay, this is, enough. this is enough. You have to be really true to yourself, true to your desire to find it in the Buddhist sense. Is there a state of mind that is totally free from suffering? If there is, it's worth going all the way. <laughs>